Many years ago, a writer from the Seinfeld show was in a car with his mom and dad. And at one point, his parents started getting in an argument, pretty heated one. And then all of a sudden, his dad yelled out, Serenity now! He knew that his dad had heard from an audio tape that that phrase could help calm you, but he wondered, does it work if you scream it like that? (laughs) Well, you know how writers use their own experience in the creative process. And so, indeed, during the final season of The Seinfeld Show, that writer on the team put that scene in it where it's George Costanza's father, Frank, that's having an argument with his mom, and he starts shouting out, Serenity, now. Raise your hand if you remember this episode. All right. (laughs) And they found, of course, that yelling it does not work. It doesn't produce peace. I want to talk today about finding your inner tranquility. I want to help you remember that you have within you an inner refuge, a place of deep calm. You could access this at any moment. But of course, it wouldn't work for me now to speak in overly energetic ways or or make this some great exhortation that you better be calm. That doesn't work, clenching your fist, talking about serenity. And so I will try to speak calmly of this place you have. You have an inner sanctuary. It's available to you when you need it and we often need it. But first, will you very calmly (laughs) bow with me? Loving God, we gather in your sanctuary and we pray for each person a sense of calm and serenity. We know Oh God, you desire a deep peace for us. We've seen this in the ministry of Jesus Christ. He came and he stilled the storm. And we can know that he can help quiet the chaos within us as well. We remember that the Gerasene demoniac was beside himself in a frenzy, but Jesus was able to restore him to himself. We welcome now the loving, calming presence of Christ, and in his name we pray. Amen. So there's a word that I use a lot, and it's sort of a bloated, turgid word. And it's one of those words that when someone says it, it sounds like they're using it to sound smarter than they really are. But this word crops up for me all the time. The word is dialectical. So dialectic is simply moving between two opposites that can both be true. Dialectic is the sort of metaphysical inquiry into how contradictions can both be true in their own way and time. Last week, I was talking about a primary dialectic within each human being between faith and doubt. At any moment, we're moving back and forth in that dialectic, feel like our belief is strong or not so much. Religion is dialectical in many, many ways. 
in, in one basic way, oftentimes religion on one side of the dialectic is trying to amp you up. So religion, when you come for some religion, it's time to get inspired and energized because we've, we've got work to do. There's more justice to achieve in our world, and, and there's, we got to get busy. And so a lot of religion is sort of trying to get revved up by the rev, right? Just trying to get, get going. A call to action, right? So a lot of religion is that, call to action. But on the other side of the dialectic. Religion seeks to bring a deep calm upon you, or better yet, to help you find that place within that is yours. You can see that exact dialectic in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Quite often in the Gospels, he's trying to rile you up. The Gospels are one big honking call to action. He's trying to get you going. In fact, do you know that some historians believe that in a primary way he was a social revolutionary, trying to foment a, a, a mass resistance, a people's movement, because in first century Palestine, there was this roiling chaos of injustice. The urban elites in Palestine were imposing taxes on the rural peasantry, but they also had foreign taxes these peasants had to pay because the Roman Empire had taken over the land. So they're paying taxes to a foreign oppressor Tax protests happen in all times around the world, and they had to pay a tax to their home urban elites. So it looks like to some historians that Jesus was trying to bring them together and, and turn them towards action, that, that this isn't right, and we've got to turn this over, because these historians know Jesus was executed by the Romans as a rebel. So they read the story as this one big call to revolution. And Jesus is super amped up in the Gospels sometimes. Remember when He throws over that table at the temple? Or He screams at the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. I mean, He'll get, he'll get animated and come at you if, if there's hypocrisy. So this one side of the dialectic, the Gospels are saying, get moving, get going. Let's make this a better world. But on the other side of that dialectic, Jesus in a primary way has come to bring shalom, peace. After He had died, the disciples were in that upper room and they were sideways, fearful, anxious, panicked. Sound familiar? Anxious. Fearful for the future. Sound familiar? And suddenly Jesus appears and says, Shalom. Peace be with you. There, is, there are numerous times in the gospel that Jesus is trying to simply decompress the moment and help you find that calm you have within you. Thomas was panicked. Thomas no longer knew what was true, no longer knew what way he should move in life, and Jesus just looked at him, just looked at him and said, let me have your eyes. I'm the way. I'm the light. To calm Thomas down. Two times at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus says shalom at key moments where they had to access that sanctuary within them. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is saying multiple times, don't be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I want to teach you just a couple things that can help you find that place 
within you of deep calm, of an equanimity, a centeredness. I want to do this by telling you about the ancient Greek philosophers that were called Stoics. They were called Stoics because they used to sit on the porch outside the Agora in Athens developing this philosophy and dialogue, and porch in Greek is stoa. So the philosophy became stoicism. And they believed that you could find, you could lay claim to this peace within you through a couple specific moves. First, you have to rigorously define in your life between what is external and what is internal. You have to rigorously understand the difference between external things that you can't really control. You would be endlessly anxious if you are constantly trying to control things you can't. So the Stoics said you have to have two categories clear in your mind, that which is internal and they would say you have much more control over your internal reality than you, than you believe. And what is external? And that there's no reason to become too anxious or fearful about external things because you can't control those. Now, this was a difficult part of the philosophy because we think a lot of external things we can control. Like, like they would talk, the Stoics would talk a lot about your reputation or your, your position or your body. Well, we think we can control a lot of that. Like, like, I should be able to control whether I'm a success in life or not. And, and I should be able to control my reputation, what people think of me to some degree. And, and my body, I, I, if, you know, I, I can work to be healthy. I have some control. But they would say, ultimately, you don't really have control of those things. You could work to be perfectly healthy and get sick still. You can't control what people think about you. And, and being a success in life has more to do with luck in their minds. They were interesting philosophers. They just say, you got lucky. It really wasn't under your control. So they make you rigorously define this. And then, then the Stoics said the key to serenity is if you can take hold of your virtues. They were teaching, you have a goodness within you. Your, your best self, this, this nobility within you of, of courage and justice and hope and, and gentleness and love, that, that if you can take hold of that, it will become your sanctuary because then when external things happen and we will all be at the whim of circumstance, when something bad happens, you will always have a choice of how to react to it. You couldn't control it. Things will just happen to you. But you always have the ability to choose how you will react. And if you go to your virtues, that, good, that goodness in you, It will be your refuge. Nothing can really touch you. One of the great Stoics, Epictetus, was a slave. Can you imagine a worse external circumstance? But he said, they can never take away my inner freedom. I've laid claim to it. It's impenetrable to them. In 1939, the Ministry of Information in England was trying to think through how can they help the populace maintain some calm in the face of warfare, and they were coming up with slogans. The Ministry of Information is that organization that was parodied in George Orwell's 1984, maybe trying to have too much control. 
but, but they were trying to make sure people stayed calm. And they, they developed a slogan. It was, keep calm and carry on. And they printed up almost three million posters that they were going to put all over the towns, keep calm and carry on. But then a paper shortage hit in England. So before that poster was ever put out, they just recycled all the paper. It was never known. It wasn't until the year 2000 that someone found one of the posters that survived in a curio shop, and then it became a really big meme, right? You've heard it before, right? You see, the reason it works so well now is you know that that's no one telling you to calm down. It's a meme that you claim for yourself. It's something you remind yourself, keep calm and carry on. It never works if some outside authority says, hey, calm down. In fact, don't you hate it when someone says, calm down? It's the worst. And usually if someone is saying calm down, there might be good reasons you shouldn't calm down. That's, that's how that works. But when you claim it for yourself, this the Stoics knew. It has to be an act of your will, your purpose, to take hold of that calm, that goodness within you. Take hold of it. You have an inner refuge. The poet Rumi had a line that I just love so much. This one line in a poem is this. Who am I standing in the midst of all this thought traffic? Who am I standing in the midst of all this thought traffic? Rumi knew that our minds are constantly going, constant traffic of thoughts. But to remember who you are, that goodness within you. The Stoics knew that our minds would be filled with the traffic of anxious thoughts all the time. Anxious, fearful thoughts coming. They said, consider your thoughts to be visitors. Let them come and then let them go. You have a place of deep calm within you, your goodness. You can control how you react to things. Deep peace to each one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.